So what we got today, it's gonna be a historical moment. I will be doing a first ever debate. But this isn't that. I'm in here in good faith to ask some hard questions. In fact, part of the reason I'm here is to practice something called the 10th man rule. The idea if nine people in a room all agree, the 10th has a duty to disagree. So that claim is false. My first point is a lack of parameter control. Julian is burning the fuel created by his reactor without proper chemical characterization. You're not breaking down the molecules. Just under vacuum. The neglect of basic analytics. I said I have the world's first handmade continuous microwave pyrolysis reactor. That is impressive, but the, the definitions are starting to change. Let's give him a round of applause. So what we got today, it's gonna to be a historical moment. I will be doing a first ever debate. We're gonna have a Ford F-250 1997 that runs off of diesel. I'm gonna put my plastic diesel for the first time inside of a Ford F-250. And on top of that, we're gonna have, somehow we got lucky and we got somebody with the exact same truck, exact same year, exact same engine. So we'll be able to do a side by side run to see how real diesel does versus plaster diesel. <laughs> Why I'm here to begin with in Chicago is I want to give a huge thank you to Dan. He's a solar engineer here in Chicago and he's going to be donating 15 solar panels to the cause to help me be able to turn plastic into fuel off of sunlight. <laughs> I want to give a huge thank you to Damien here. He has connected me with many people in Oak Park and uh, gave me a place to stay. Huge thank you to Damien. <laughs> huge thank you to Shannon. Shannon is the guy who gave us this space. So huge thank you to Shannon as well. <laughs> and huge thank you to Noah here. Noah is actually a critic of my work and he has come up and he is the contestant in the debate, so thank you, Noah, very much. I know it's, it takes some courage, so thank you, Noah. So what we're gonna do here, uh, we're gonna kick off with a, a 20 minute debate. We'll have 10 one minute segments each. We'll begin with him and he'll say his part, his critiques, and I'll be able to say my defense and we'll go from there and Damien here will be moderating, making sure we stay within our timeline. All right, so thank you all again. You guys ready? Yeah. All right. First off, got to do an opening statement. I want to commend Julian, what he's built both in terms of machines and a massive audience. It's genuinely impressive. The drive, the determination, the sheer willingness to do the thing instead of talk about it. It's rare and deserves respect. We need more people like Julian, people who build, who get their hands dirty, and who try to solve big problems head on. It's easy to critique from the sidelines and much harder to cut steel, wire up electronics, and build a platform that inspires millions. And I want to be honest about something. I believe this is Julian's first in-person debate, as it's mine, and I'm not under any illusion that this is an even playing field. He has a large, passionate following, and I expect that just by showing up to challenge some of his ideas, I'll probably get insulted, online and maybe even in this room. But that's okay, because Julian deals with plenty of that himself. I don't come here to win anything. I came here because I want to see Julian win, long term. I see someone with tremendous potential who's made some decisions that I think are expensive and uninformed. And I see that. And when I see that, I speak up. Not to tear anyone down, but to offer perspective. Today I feel lucky because Julian's here in Chicago and we get to have this conversation face to face. No filters, no algorithms, no comment sections. Just two people with different views trying to find common ground. Online criticism, especially anonymous criticism, is easy to dismiss, and it should be. But this isn't that. I'm in here in good faith to ask some hard questions, the same ones I've seen echoed across his comment sections, and hopefully to create some teachable moments for both of us. In fact, part of the reason I'm here is to practice something called the 10th man rule. The idea if nine people in a room all agree, the 10th has a duty to disagree, to pressure test the consensus. And that's what I'm doing today, offering the opposing point of view, not to attack, but to strengthen the conversation. So let's get into it, respectfully, intelligently, and maybe by the end of, with a bit more mutual understanding than we started with. Thank you. And everybody, I just want to make a quick statement. It takes a lot of courage to come here like Noah has. I understand, of course, you guys support me, but if he makes a good point, cheer him on, clap for him too, because both sides, both polarities of everything for something to grow. 
And so I very much respect him for making it out. Think about how many people sit back and talk but wouldn't have the balls to actually come out here and do a face-to-face -face debate. So once again, applause for Noah and let's get this thing going. Okay, my first point is a lack of parameter control. Julian does not control key operational variables such as temperature, pressure, or microwave power output. These are fundamental parameters in pyrolysis. Without control or real-time monitoring, the system cannot be safely operated, yield reproducible results, or be optimized for efficiency or quality. This approach is not aligned with any professional standard for chemical engineering, material science, or reactor design. So to break this down a little bit, is what I've heard is that Julian likes to run his reactor under vacuum, which is a certain parameter. All of these plastics have different degradation pathways, and by doing it under one parameter that's based solely on the output of his microwaves isn't going to produce any consistent results. Pressures and temperatures are directly related. Higher pressures mean higher temperatures. If he, re if he regulated his pressure, he would have higher temperatures, which result in usually smaller molecules, which are usually less carcinogenic. All right. So I would like to say that the claim that I do not monitor my temperatures or pressures is erroneous. My machine, you can look at any one of my YouTube videos, I have a computer screen up that shows me the temperature, shows me the pressure. And I do have control of it as well. So for example, in my monitoring of the vacuum of my machine, I'm able to completely control based on my recovery pump the negative pressures I want within my chamber. He mentioned I, don't have, I, do, I do not have control over uh, the amount of microwave input on my machine because my machine uses microwaves. And that's not true because I can control how many magnetrons or microwave generators are turned on at once. And that also is directly correlated to the temperature. So by having more microwaves or less microwaves, I'm gonna have a higher temperature or a lower temperature. And I have temperature probes all throughout the machine to let me know what the temperature is at all times. So that claim is false. So are you doing high pressure pyrolysis or are you doing strictly low pressure pyrolysis or under vacuum? Because if you are not doing high pressure pyrolysis, you're not breaking down the molecules. Just under vacuum. Okay. All right. Point number two, burning unknown fuel. Julian is burning the fuel created by his reactor without proper chemical characterization. Only a single analytical test has been shared and that test showed over 6% benzene content. Benzene is a group one carcinogen and that's 10x above the EPA long-term limits for fuel. It also had high levels of styrene and benzene derivatives. It's a dangerous fuel and is not considered a viable alternative to any fuel. Despite this, he has shown no true filtration or catalytic cracking. The activated carbon and alumina and zeolite does nothing to absorb anything selectively out of his uh, hydrocarbon path. It's not at a high enough temperature to crack anything catalytically. There's very little emission treatment and he doesn't do any regular compositional analysis to confirm this. All right, so I did send a, a few samples out back in, I believe it was December. I sent them out for an, an analysis to get an idea of what my products were. And I haven't done an analysis with that same uh, lab since because that specific lab, they had a machine that limited their analysis to only showing the products that come over at 90 degrees C, which is about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means they only heated up my products to 180 degrees and analyze the vapors that came off at that temperature. And that's not a good analysis because that's only gonna let you know that specific temperature. But when you put a, a fuel in an engine, it's reaching temperatures up to like 6,000 degrees, 600 to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So I need an analysis done that shows that, a true emissions test in a, the true type of combustion. And so I actually already am in the works of that. I have a lab in Washington and I have a lab in Houston that I'm sending samples out as soon as possible so we can get the exact true analysis of the full spectrum of my products. And that's perfect. That brings me to the next point, which is the neglect of basic analytics. With the grants and funding received, Julian could easily pur purchase a gas chromatic graph with flame ionization detector for around 5000 There would be other expensive, like standards and setting up for injectors, potentially hedge-based samplers, but those are necessities if you're going to be doing this type of process. This would allow him to conduct daily routine fuel analysis, probably every 10 minutes he would be able to see what's in his fuel. This would allow him to characterize his fuels accurately, identify toxic or undesirable byproducts, and optimize the person that you talked about, mass spec everything. Uh, he's open 
to all of this, uh, and I would imagine that he could help you source the correct equipment, standards, and methods. So, the reason why I have not spent the large price to purchase that type of equipment to do my own analysis is because it's very expensive and I am trying to optimize my machine. So for example, the reason I'm here is to get it to run off of solar. And on top of that, I want to make my machine continuous. I'm doing it all by hand, all by myself. And until I have those specific parameters in place, have it continuous, all the power I want, the variables I would get if I spent $6,000 on a machine, it would change the moment I do the upgrades I want to do. So I always saw it as, let me prioritize finishing the machine, getting everything I want done first, and then I can. That way, when I do an analysis, whether I'm sending it out or doing it myself, it can be actually accurate to the machine at its full potential and full capability. But despite that, I'm still sending out samples in the way how it is now, so I can have a comparison when we have it off of solar. Okay. I'll skip over then to false claims about continuous operation. Argument Julian refers to it, the reactor as the first continuous microwave fibrolysis reactor, but in reality, his system is batch fed or semi continuous at best, lacking real time feed and discharge control. This is not a continuous reactor by any accepted technical definition, making this claim misleads funders, collaborators, and the public. I can give some examples, and up here and on that back table, there's an actual couple continuous microwave pyrolysis reactors that you can get off of Alibaba. Um, so th those are false claims, and with the continu continuous feed, he could save $1,500 on the flanges alone for a very difficult feed system with bridging, gapping, and everything that's okay. all got to be under okay, pressure. So, first of all, I never said that I have the first, the world's first continuous microwave pyrolysis reactor. I said I have the world's first handmade continuous microwave pyrolysis reactor, meaning one person made it themselves in their backyard or with limited material, not a million dollar, billion dollar budget, not, not a whole bunch of equipment. I did it by myself and that's what I meant when I said that statement with all those words specifically in that order. Is it continuous? And, and, and yes, you're right, by technical definition, it's not absolutely continuous because that, for it to be absolutely continuous means that it has to have systems in place to where it can basically all run itself, right? But it's basically the guidelines to that because the only difference between making it completely continuous and how I have it now is to have the big budget, to have the computers and the PLCs in place to do that. So yes, you're right. It, by technical definition, it's not continuous, but nobody can take the fact away that a semi-continuous handmade microwave pyrolysis reactor was built. That is impressive, but the, the definitions are starting to change. I will say that there is an over-engineered and efficient feed system. He's developing a complex system of vacuum sealed material handlers and a pressure tolerant hoppers. This is intended to feed fluffy shredded plastic, which is difficult to move under pressure, low density, and prone to bridging and clumping. Yet for around $3,000 or less, he could buy a shredder and plastic extruder. He could melt the, pump, uh, the plastic and pump it in as a dense, uniform stream into the reactor. This stops so many different, uh, different issues that he will come across. Different contaminants, the difference in the volume, he would be able to control a stream for actual continuous processing. And also, he's doing about five to ten <coughs> times the volume of the reactor that he would need to with, a, uh, with molten plastic. One pound only needs one liter of volume compared to the one pound to hey, five to ten liters that he's using on his reactor. So I've seen that a few times, people saying I should use an extruder to melt plastic and load it in that way. And the reason why I'm not doing that or going down that route is because I want to actually deal with true plastic waste. And plastic waste is not just plastic, it's plastic with paper, plastic with aluminum, plastic with food and oil. And if you look at extruders, they can only extrude certain types of plastic for one, and they can't extrude plastics or mix with things like paper. So that would defeat the whole purpose of my machine, being able to get rid of true plastic waste. If I want to get ocean waste, now I need to filter it and sort it to make sure it can actually be extruded right so you can only extrude thermoset plastics right and not every plastic is a thermoset plastic only some of them so that's why I don't do that and in regards to the other critiques of my continuous feed system if you actually had seen in one of my videos I mentioned how I had some flaws with the first one I built and how I spent $1,500 on metal to actually upgrade it and make it even better because I learned from my mistakes and I have a way to have even more volume going at once so I think that it's, that's not a fair critique because I wasn't done with the continuous feed system and I made videos showing that. So that's what I have to say.
Scaling up without bench testing is a big problem and trying to move on to continuous feed. Julian's rapidly scaling up to larger semi-continuous systems without completing a rigorous bench scale testing. He has no documented proof of consistent performance at all. Sparse or no yield mass balance data. We're seeing pressure readings for his natural gas, no actual weights on that carbon. Uh, mass balances are pretty important. And toxicity and emission profiles, which would be able to be found on a bench scale before going into a large, large system that potentially creates more poison. When you're scaling up, you're gonna become a target of the EPA. Skipping bench scale validation undermines reproducibility, Another process control. understanding, and scientific legitimacy. I've got some pictures of bench scale stuff that you can look at on either of these tables. So in regards to what you said about the EPA, I've actually already been in contact with the EPA directly. They had no problem with what I do because as I always say to everybody, my machine itself has zero emissions. The only emissions come from when you burn the products from the machine. And so with that, it's a completely closed and captured process and that's one of the power points of it because no matter what- Are you burning fuel, them today? What, what was that? Are you burning them today? Sorry. No, I don't, I do not no, burn no, my, no. my fuel products every day if that was what you said. But today. that's, that's, that's also in terms of burning it today, how are you supposed to know if it works in the engine without burning it? It's that analytics. Simple. And well, you can do analytics, but it doesn't say how it burns in an engine, right? Because engines all operate very differently, right? Different lubricosities, different specific gravities, all these different things actually pertain, or even the flash point, right? That's what makes gasoline and diesel different, right? So you have to know how it burns in the engine. And guess what? It's either me burning it here or they're gonna burn it somewhere else. Misleading and grandiose social media presence. Julian's videos, highly dramatic and stylized visuals and inaccurate marketing terms use misleading technical language and promote and unverified claims. He avoids discussing real te technical limitations of pyrolysis, acknowledging toxins, emissions, or energy balance issues, posting yield data, energy inputs, or mass balances. His, this public-facing strategy misleads the lay audience, undermines trust in real scientists, and distracts from viable solutions. I feel like it could be approached a little bit more honestly, and from a scientific standpoint, I don't feel like it necessarily is. Something I want to address, he said I have no documented proof of consistent operations of my machine. That's not true in December. There was a time when I took a whole week and I did six to eight hour live streams back to back running the machine, showing the entire data over and over again with consistent runs. You can look that up in December on YouTube. And in returns, let me talk please. What you said about emissions and burning things, we'll say it like this. When plastic is left outside in the environment, it is going to release eth ethylene and methane. Methane is of course a horrible greenhouse gas and has a half-life of over 12 years. You said that my fuel has benzene and styrene in it. Benzene, if that were the case, when it's combusted only emits CO2, carbon monoxide, water vapor, and soot. None of those things are particularly harmful. Styrene, styrene at worst is an irritant. Styrene also only has a half-life of about six hours. Benzene only has a half-life of about 12 days. So we're way better off turning plastic into fuel just by half-lives of chemicals alone than to just leave it in the ocean and leave it in landfills. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.